Good morning, and welcome to the online worship service for United Christian Church of Country Club Hills. My name is Pamela Kinderbrew, and I am thankful to be here with you on this blessed day. You are tuned into our worship service for Sunday, October 11, 2020. Whether you are a church member, visitor, friend, or a family member, we are thankful that you have chosen to worship with us today. Our scripture reading today is Romans 15, verses 5 through 7. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another, then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearing and understanding of his word. 
Amen. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, thank you for bringing us in safety and health to this place of fellowship. We are thankful that we can surrender our lives to you in worship. As we gather, let us take a moment to remember all of those who could not be with us today. For those who are sick, we pray for their healing so that they may gather again to praise you. We invite your Holy Spirit to move among us and dwell within our hearts. Challenge us, comfort us, and support us as we work to honor you. Inspire us to learn more about your majestic ways and the beauty of your grace. We ask for all of this in your name and in the name of your most holy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And as we continue in our worship service, I wish that you have a wonderful day. Today is the day that the Lord has made, and we are rejoicing, and we are glad in it. It is prayer time, church. We have so much going on in our state, 
in our nation, in our country, and around the world. Church, if there's ever a time that we need God, now is that time. We give God thanks and praise for a God who hears our prayers and answers our prayers. We give thanks and praise to a God who is a comforter, provider, and one who loves us unconditionally. Church, we lift up those who are sick. We lift up those who have lost loved ones. We lift up our children, educators, first responders. We lift up families, spouses, parents. We have so much on our plates, so much on our minds. We pray for those who are dealing with mental health issues, those who are struggling during this pandemic season. So let us come together and go to the throne of grace and mercy once again. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, let us join together in prayer. Good and most gracious God, we come saying thank you for this day. God, thank you for allowing us to see the sun rise on this day that you've made. God, thank you for roofs over our heads, clothes on our backs, daily bread on our table. God, we thank you for family. We thank you for friends. God, we thank you for a body of believers called the church. God, you've done so much for us. God, we thank you not only because of what you've done, but we thank you for who you are, the creators of the heavens and the earth, the one who set the earth upon the axis, the Alpha of the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was before there was, and the one who will be once there's nothing left. God, we thank you. God, you understand what we're going through. God, we trust in and believe in, in your will. God, you said that the righteous would never be forsaken. God, you said you would be a comforter. God, you said you would be a provider. And we trust in and believe in on that word. God, we ask that you bless our children. Give them a heart and a desire for you. God, we ask that you bless marriages, and we ask that you bless individual households. God, bless this country. There is so much division and hate on all aspects. God, we understand that that's not of you. God, have us to have us to turn back to love, turn back to you, forgive us of the errors of our ways, God, soften our hearts, give us a mind for you, and God, have us to be ambassadors of yours here on earth, and God. Have us to be an example to be set in this dark world. Have us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. God, have us not be the same way as we close out this day as we were when we started this day. God, use us. Use us for your will. Use us for your purpose. 
God bless those who are struggling financially. Bless those who are struggling physically. And bless those who are struggling mentally. God, for those who are looking for an answer, have them to see you through us. God bless the leadership of this nation. Bless world leadership. Have them to understand and follow your ways. God bless, <clears throat> excuse me, the leadership of the church. Bless the leadership of United Christian Church. God, thank you for Reverend Ken King. Give him a mind for you. Give him a heart for you. God, protect them, surround them through these difficult days. Bless his wife, bless his parents. God, we thank you for lay leadership here at United Christian. Continue to have them to serve as they've been serving over the last 10 years. God, we thank you. God, we lift up these prayers to you. And God, we're careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. God, we love you. We thank you. And we pray this prayer in your Son, our Savior's name, Jesus Christ. And we say it together, Amen. Family, God loves you. And so do I.
boys and girls. It's Miss Sharice. I'm so excited to be here on this beautiful Sunday morning, and I hope that you all have had a great week. So let's have children's moment with Miss Sharice. Now, as you know, last week we talked about a man named who? Noah. And what did he build for God? A boat? Noah's Ark. Very good. So because God spared his life and Noah obeyed God, God made Noah a promise. So today we're going to talk about that promise that he made Noah, and it's something very special. So grab your Bibles, and we are going to Genesis 9, verses 11, 12, and 13. So 11 through 13. And it says, I make this agreement with you. I will never again destroy all living things by flood waters. A flood will never again destroy the earth. And God said, I am making an agreement between me and you and every living creature that it is with you. It will continue from now on. This is the sign. I am putting my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of the agreement between me and the earth. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm sure everyone has seen a ring like this before. It's a special kind of ring. Do you know what kind of ring it is? It's a wedding ring that mommies and daddies and grandmas and grandpas have on. It's a very simple ring. It has no diamonds or it has nothing on it, no engravements, no words, nothing. It's a band that can be silver or gold. This one, the picture, that's silver. It may look gold there, but that's silver. Okay? But it is a very, very special because it is a reminder of a promise that is made between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. Okay? They make a promise that they will love and stand by faith beside one another. And it says they will do it for better for worse, for richer, for poor, okay, for sickness and in health. That's what this promise is saying, boys and girls. Each person that's married, they wear a wedding band as a reminder of a promise that they made to one another. The ring also tells everyone who sees this about the promise that there's a couple, that's a married man, that's a married woman. So, we all sometimes make promises, don't we? Hmm? Yeah, I have. We may make a promise to our mothers that we're going to clean our rooms. We make a promise to our friends that we're not going to tell a secret. We make a promise that we're going to return things. We make a promise that we're going to be good. We make a promise that we're going to get good grades, right? Those are all promises. But guess what? Promises can be broken, too. Has anyone ever broke their promise? I have before. Or has anyone ever broken a promise that they told you? It's happened, yes. And how does that make you feel? Sad, yeah, disappointed, upset, very good. And you may say things like, you said, or you promised. You may say those type of things, right? So today in our Bible verse, we talked about how God makes a promise right and god made a promise to noah the man who built the ark that if he would take his family he would build this ark he would get how many of each animal two of every kind of animals and put them on the boat and shut the door and god said i'm gonna flood the land and destroy everyone else besides you your family and those animals right so noah did that he obeyed God. So because God had to destroy all of that and Noah paid attention to God, God told Noah, he said, I promise you, Noah, I promise you that I would never, ever destroy this earth again. I will never flood this earth again. That was his promise. And God said, showing you this promise, Noah, I am going to put in the sky every time it rains because it still has to rain, right? We need it for the crops, for the grass to grow. He said, I'm going to put in the sky a rainbow. 
a rainbow full of different colors, beautiful, bright colors, showing that I said that I would never, ever flood this earth, Noah, or to us. So, have you all ever seen a rainbow? Yes. And sometimes it can be raining so bad. And guess what, boys and girls? It has been floods, but it's never been a flood where God destroyed everything or everyone even though sometimes the world can be mean and it can be crooked and evil people and people are not obeying and doing what god says he still kept his promise god is a man that he is not going to take away the promises that he told us especially if it's in his word boys and girls god promised all things in fact, there's another Bible verse. He says, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. They are in him. So he will not break his promises between us. Okay? So it's going to flood. It's going to rain. It's going to be okay. It's going to thunder. It's going to lightning outside. It's going to be loud. It's going to be a lot of rain. It's going to be a little rain. But because God said to Noah in Genesis 9 verses 11 through 13, he would never flood this earth again or destroy us. And he made his promise of the rainbow. So always remember that. So what I want you to remember today is... Mommies and daddies and grandpas and grandmas and other people that you know and even you when you get older you get married This is your promise to one another in love that you promise to be there for one another because it's the covenant of God The next thing I want you to remember is Obey God because he's always got to make a promise to you and he will never break his promise and the third thing is you're going to run into people, into situations where you're going to have to break a promise or someone is going to break a promise to you. But you always have another chance to do it right. To do it right and remember God's word. So let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for all the promises that you have made us. We thank you for creating this world and never destroying this earth and for seeing your rainbow, for the promise that you made Noah. Now we ask that you continue to let us keep our promises or the people we come in contact with keep their promises to us. Let us obey your word, obey our parents, obey our teachers, and just be good servants of you, O oh God. We thank you for today and each and every day. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we say, amen. Amen, boys and girls. I'm so happy to be here on today with you all. And I promise to be back next week. Love you all. Have a great Sunday. Bye. set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth and I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love I know But 
when the world has seen the light They will dance with joy like we're dancing now I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever. Good morning, beloved, and welcome to our October 11th worship experience here at United Christian Church. I'm James King, senior pastor here at United, and I am so glad. I know I always say that, but I really am. I'm glad that each of you are tuning in in your various homes and places of worship. I know some are even doing like watch parties now on Facebook. Thank you. That is so cool. And um, I just want to tell you that for those who really just give a lot of um, accolades and thanks for the worship service, the way our worship service put, is put together, I just want you to know that it is not me by myself. There is a team of people who actually work on compiling videos and such. So want to take our hats off to our worship leader, um, Brother Kevin Benford, and to all the folks that are out there just putting these things together, you do a great job. To our elders, folks who are sharing communion videos, thank you so much. They're really the ones that actually pull this worship service together. So without further ado, I want to dive right into today's sermon. And this is now our fourth part in our four-part series entitled, I Want to Believe, But... Dot, dot, dot. And this is a series that deals with some of the four main reasons that people often give for struggling with believing in God. I believe that when we look at these issues that folks struggle with, that they're not really struggling or rejecting the true biblical nature of God, but what they're rejecting are the distortions of who they think God should be. And so let's do a quick recap. On our first week, we studied and talked about the on-demand God. This is the God that gives you everything that you want. And what we discovered is that that God doesn't exist. The second thing that we learned was we looked at the Debbie Downer God. This is the God who doesn't want you to enjoy your life or have fun because all he wants you to do is be miserable and obey a whole bunch of rules. We discovered that God wants you to live free and that Jesus even boils down the entire book of the Bible into two basic sentences. Or I guess one basic sentence with two components to them. The first is love God with all of your heart and love people like you'd want yourself to be loved. That's it. Last Sunday, we talked about the goosebump God. This is the image or the distortion of God that people seem to not be able to embrace because they feel like if you can't feel him, he's not real. We discovered that feelings are not fact, nor are they faith. The truth is that God is always present and available. And today, in our final um, installment in this series, we'll be talking about the heartless God. This is probably the one I think more people than any reject about God because they believe that God simply doesn't care about our pain or our suffering. And so our focal scripture this morning comes from Matthew chapter 11, and I'm going to be reading verses um, 2 through 3, but later on we're going to read quite a bit more. So I just want you to know that we're starting out with Matthew chapter 11 verses 2 through 3. And if you're looking at this broadcast on our um, uccdoc.com website, 
there is actually a Bible tab there where you can click on that little Bible tab and it opens right up to Matthew chapter 11. Just for those of you who are um, wanting to follow the scriptures along, you can do that with our, our um, screen interface there on our homepage. Let's read together. Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 3. Now we're reading through the New Living Translation. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing, so he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this moment to share your word with the many people who watch this broadcast. And I'm asking now, God, that you would allow me to be transparent as I share your word. Allow those who would hear my voice, that they would connect with Jesus and to see you as the true and living God. So, Father, I know there will be no preaching unless you preach. So I empty myself of this clay vessel and I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, that those who are under the sound of my voice, that they would see and embrace and come to know Jesus. We ask this in his precious name. Amen. As I'm preparing this message, I came across a lot of little things. And one of the things I came across was an old hashtag that was trending a few years ago. And it was called four word horror stories. And what I mean is that, you know, four words, that if you put them all together and they made sense, that these would be like your personal nightmare. Like, ah. Uh. And so I've got like seven of them I want to share with you. Here's my first four word horror story that I found. The spider got away. Some of you right now are saying, yep, that's my horror story. Here's another one for some of those who are coffee coffee fans. We're out of coffee. Or how about this one? Internal Revenue Service calling. A few months ago, um, we all could relate to this one. No more toilet paper. I know you're laughing, right? How about this next one? In the middle of the night, this is your forward horror story. Did you hear something? And now I've got two more left. I know, don't, don't, just stay with me, stay with me. The last two, the internet is down. Yeah, that one had created quite a panic in my house a little while ago. And then the last one, honey, remember that spider? I know these are kind of goofy. And, you know, what can you expect from Twitter? Most of the time, folks are just, you know, putting stuff out there. And to be completely honest, they're not being very honest most of the time. And they don't really dive deeply into what, how they might really be suffering when we consider what would be a real horror story. But my goal today is really to tackle probably the number one reason people are struggling with believing in God. And I believe there's a good chance that some of you even struggle with these tensions, um, even with yourself or someone that you know, about whether or not God really is heartless. See, it boils down to this when we think about whether or not God is heartless. People will say, how can you believe in a God who would allow that to happen? Or to put it another way, some folks might say, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? So if you ever had a serious conversation with family or friends about your belief in God or your faith, I'm almost certain that this question or struggle is inevitable to come up. Over time, we've really discovered that there is no real good resolution to this conversation, leaving some people in the position that they want to believe God, but dot, 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 God must be heartless. For many of us, um, this, this may be a place where we engage in an intellectual exercise. We're just saying, well, you know, I'll just ignore that, that God may seem distant at time, and it just becomes an intellectual exercise for you, where it feels like there's a, a, a logical fallacy that if God could be all-powerful and all-loving, yet slavery happened, how can that be? If God could be all-powerful and all-loving, how did the Holocaust happen? So with, the, with this deep internal struggle, um, it, it is my desire that some of you might move to another place. Because I know even now, some folks struggle with some of the glad songs that we sing in church because it seems to go against what your experience is. Like even now in 2020, we see that black men and women and children are being killed right before our eyes on TV with very little accountability. And in our 24-hour news cycle, never like any time before, have we been aware of the message that evil and pain are rampant in our world? And because we see this constantly, it fuels the mindset that either God is all loving and God is all powerful, but he can't be both. So 
I didn't want this message to be a continuation of some kind of philo philosophical discussion because it goes way beyond philosophy. For most of us, this struggle is personal. It's personal for you and it's personal for me. And I know that if I ask some of you right now from our own United family, if you could tweet out your own four-word horror story for a time in your life when God, se when God seemed heartless to you, I know that you wouldn't tweet something like, the spider got away. You would probably tweet something like, molested by my uncle. My meds aren't helping. Three tours, rampant PTSD. School is a nightmare. Prayed, chemo didn't work. I hate being alone. The doctors have given up. When we put this message in the context of the reality of our lives, it ceases to be hypothetical or philosophical, and it becomes very real. So in the realness, and I think even the sacredness of even this discussion, I, I, I want to make two promises to you. The first is this, I promise that I am not going to be able to answer all of your questions. And my second promise is that I promise that I will point you to some handles that may help you to hold on to God's unchanging hand in moments when it seems like God is most heartless. I hope also to comfort some of you who are hurting personally and to provide you with some measure of clarity so that you who are struggling with this intellectually might be able to say, ah, I get it. Because the truth is, if God is heartless, then nothing in your life is going to change. But, but if there is something more to God, then today there is a very real chance that, that today you can have the opportunity to rethink not just who God is, but who you are in relationship to that God. And this potential has the change, has the, this potentially has the ability to change everything for you. So let's dive into the message. And as we do so, we're going to take a look at the life of John the Baptist. Now, as far as New Testament biblical figures go, John is a big deal. He appears in all four Gospels. And in my study, I learned something about John that I never saw before. And I'm going to take you there so that we might have some context. But, but look, before we get there, I want to talk about who John is. And I want to give you what I call the free stuff. This is the background or the context to the story. First of all, John was a distant cousin of Jesus. So John's mom, Elizabeth, was a cousin to Jesus' mom, Mary. And if you want to look that up yourself, it's in Luke chapter 1, verse 36. Before John was conceived, before he was conceived, his purpose was defined by God. That's in Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. And then from the womb, John was able to recognize Jesus who was in his mother's womb recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. You'll see that in Luke chapter 1, verse 41. And then finally, one of the last little bullet points I'll give you about John is that John would point the way to the Messiah in life. That's in Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 16. You see, John's ministry as an adult was, was a little bit weird. In fact, John was quite a character. He was described as one who had a tunic made out of hair and that he wore a leather belt around his waist, that he ate locusts and wild honey that he came out preaching a message of repentance and also mentioning that there was someone who was coming who would take away the sins of the world. And John had a massive following of people. They would meet him down at the Jordan River where he would baptize them in repentance of their sins and in preparation of Jesus who was coming to baptize them with the Holy Spirit. Now, John came to, to be, Jesus came to be baptized by John reluctantly because John felt like I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. But when John finally re realized that he's got to baptize Jesus because Jesus insisted, he baptizes him and John and others who might have been around, they see the Holy Spirit appear like a dove and then descend over Jesus. And then they hear a voice from heaven speak out loud. You can find it in Luke chapter 3, verse 22 in the last part of that, where it says, you are my dearly beloved son and you bring me great joy. John declares, look, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I've been talking about. John believes that Jesus is the one who would die for the world's sins, reconciling humankind back to God. This moment is the pinnacle 
of John's ministry and his life. So, after the baptism, John goes back to the wilderness. He continues to preach that Jesus is the Messiah, pointing everyone to follow him. And Jesus, he goes on to continue his ministry. And then John gets in trouble. You see, the king of the land at that time, his name was Herod. And Herod decided he was going to marry his brother's ex-wife, which violated Old Testament law. John knew this. And John made it known that the king was in violation or in sin. If John probably had a, had a Twitter account, he'd be putting them on blast. That's what they'd call it, putting them on blast. But, but John, as he's declaring their married sin, the king, King Herod, and his queen, they didn't like that. And they really wanted to kill him. But they couldn't do that because John had a huge following. And if they did it, there would be mass rioting. They didn't want to do all that and go through those changes. So they put him in jail for now. And so we pick up John's story in Matthew chapter 11. And we find John in prison with his own four-word horror story. Hashtag jailed might die here. And so we pick up his story here in, John, or in Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 6. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard all about the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? Jesus spoke to John's disciples and told them, go back and tell John what you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, and those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being proclaimed to the poor. And he added, God bless those who do not fall away because of me. Right after Jesus says this to John's disciples, he begins to speak to the crowd about John the Baptist. And we're going to go there in a moment because that's that moment where I had uh, this aha that I'd never seen before. But John, now he's spent his whole life, remember, his whole life pointing his way and preparing the path for Jesus, declaring that Jesus would be the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the earth. John now goes to jail. He sends a message to Jesus. Are you the Messiah that we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? In this moment, what John is doing is that John, he's doubting. John is actually now, at this moment, he's questioning the validity and maybe even the relationship that he had with Jesus. This message is acting straight, asking straight up, <clears throat> are you the one? Because I spent my whole life preparing the way for you. All that John had seen, all that John had experiment, experienced, <clears throat> John doubts. We don't know how long he might have been in jail before he sent that message to Jesus that basically says, Jesus, are you indifferent to my circumstance or are you just incapable of doing something about it? That's really what his message is saying. Your boy is in jail. To John, all of this doesn't add up. And, and, and he's facing these same tensions that you and I face when it comes to this question. Is God heartless? Because God seems either indifferent to my situation or incapable of doing something about it. I get where John is coming from. You see, he's Jesus' cousin. They grew up together. They were probably boys just kicking it and hanging out. And then their ministries took them in different paths, but they were still close. I would imagine that John, being arrested, probably said to himself, I ain't going to be here long. You don't know who my, who my cousin is. He's fitting to get up in this thing. We could imagine this happening, or I could imagine it. See, he could probably say to the arresting officers, now y'all done done it, y'all done done it, y'all messed up. When my boy Jesus hears about this, he's the one who can heal the sick, raise the dead. He's the one that opens blind eyes, turns water into wine. When Jesus hears about y'all putting me in jail, when he rolls up, he's going to come with about maybe 10, 15, 25 angels. They're going to be big. Y'all can't stop them. They're probably going to drop every single one of y'all. All the locks on the prisons are going to just fall off. Everyone's going to get a get out of jail free pass. And then Jesus, he's going to come up to me and say, John, he's going to hug me, probably throw a cape over my shoulders like James Brown and Maceo, bam. And then he's going to say, when as he's walking out, I might see Herod and just like dab on Herod, give Jesus a fist bump, and he's going to be out the door. I think John was thinking all that, that he wouldn't be in jail long. I can imagine that as he's waiting and waiting, and he's finding that one day turns to a week, and then a week 
turns to a couple of weeks and a couple of weeks turn into months. Maybe while John was in jail, he begins to make these marks on the wall just to pass the time. And every single mark represented a day that Jesus left him. We don't know how long he was actually in jail before he sent his doubting letter. But what we do know is that he was in jail for two years before he died. The, the fact that John doubts, to me, communicates that John wanted to believe, but dot, dot, dot. Jesus seemed unloving or incapable. I mean, why would a loving Jesus, my boy, why would Jesus let this happen to me? After all, I'm John the Baptist. Each of us, each of us can relate to, to, to John and John can relate to us because all of us have had moments where things looked really bad. One of the worst things that can happen to you is when a well-intended Christian probably comes up to you with these empty phrases to try to make you feel better. Y'all know what I'm saying. High five somebody near you or maybe just high five the screen if you've heard this before when you're going through. Someone comes up to you and they say, well, God's not going to give you more than you can handle. Or maybe they'll say it this way. Well, God's giving it to you because God believes you can handle it. And then they smile. They always got that smile, right? You see, the reason these phrases are toxic is because they ostracize you. They separate you from the real God who is present. You don't actually feel comforted. You feel discouraged. And if I could give you just one more free thing about that statement, people saying God won't give you more than you can handle, that ain't in the Bible. You see, that person is actually misquoting 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, which deals with temptation and sin. What we're talking about today is suffering. One day I'll, I'll do a sermon, a sermon series entitled Things That People Say That Ain't in the Bible. It'll probably say just like that, right? But I digress. Back, back, to, the ser back to the sermon. So in the middle of your struggle, you hear phrases like this, and you know these things can't be true because deep down inside of you, when you look at your own four-word horror story, you know you can't handle this by yourself. So as I continue my study with John in this situation where he's in jail, he's doubting Jesus, we, we can see that not only can we relate to the tension of a heartless Jesus, we can also see that John shows us how we might find relief from these tensions. You see, John is in this place of imprisonment. He asks a question, and it's the only question that really makes any sense in the context of this story. But actually, it's the only question that has power to help us determine whether God is heartless or not. Here's the question. What, what the question is, is that he wants to know, are you the Messiah that we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? You see, in the midst of the silence from Jesus, John perceives as either indifference or, incap or incapability. John is asking the one question that you and I need to ask today as we navigate this message. You see, because if Jesus isn't the Messiah, if Jesus isn't who he says he is, then the things that we're going through and what John is going through is never going to get any better. But if he is... If Jesus is the Messiah, then there is a possibility that there might be more to the context of what we're going through in the moment. I think we can all understand that a moment without context is absolutely misleading. For all of our United Christian Church family, you all know that when I give this free stuff, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give you context so that you will arrive at the correct destination. Because if someone comes to you in their trouble and you just look at the moment, Without context, you will often find yourself at the wrong conclusion. And so John is asking the question so that he might have context to his own suffering. He wants to know whether or not Jesus is the Messiah. In the, in the midst of his pain, in the midst of his suffering, he wants to know, is there a chance for hope? Is there a possibility for peace? If he's not the Messiah, then being in jail... Being in pain, being isolated, this is just what you get. So for the rest of this message, I want to look at some truths that God, John gives us to not only support why we can know God is loving, but we can also hold on to these truths in moments when we feel like maybe God is heartless and that you won't lose hope. And these truths are not only holding true for you, 
For if they're under the banner of Jesus, you will be able to hold fast, knowing who Jesus really is. So here's my first point. I only have two this morning. Just my first point. If Jesus is the Messiah, then, point number one, in the presence of pain, it does not prove the absence of God. That the presence of pain does not prove the absence of God. I know this is hard for us because if God wants us to do anything, why does it have to be difficult or painful or hard, right? I know you're thinking that, you're saying that. But if Jesus is the Savior of the world, then we can look at our pain in the context of the cross and trust that God will indeed meet us in the middle of our pain. In Psalm 34, verse 18, reading from the New Living Translation, this is what the text says. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. What does that mean? Well, it, it means that the, that, that the heart of God, that there's more than anything else at the heart of God, God is bent to a drawing us closer to God's self. God desires to be known and to know each of us. Jesus says there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people. This means that the level of celebration in heaven that goes on is equal to the energy and the urgency of finding you. You see, God does love you and God cares for you. The problem is that we often just don't seek God to draw closer to him when things are going great. I mean, can we be true about it? That when we encounter someone who's going through, who's growing in their faith, and you really have a chance to talk with them, they're not going to tell you, oh, I felt, gr I felt so close to God when things were peachy. No, what they're going to tell you is that the time when things were falling apart, that's when they began to experience the closeness of God. That doesn't mean that God causes bad things to happen to us just so he can get our attention. But what it does mean is that God is going to meet you in the middle of your pain. Because if Jesus is the Messiah, then we don't have to know that God is sitting back somewhere watching us suffer. We have a God who suffers with us. Again, it has to be looked at from the context of the cross. We have a God who meets us in the pain. This is why the question, is Jesus the Messiah most important for you? Because if we look back to Jesus and John the Baptist, the presence of pain just doesn't prove that God is absent. And, and, and for John, the doubts in his mind don't prove that God is absent. What it does is that it proves that perhaps this is all going to be worth it. Let's look at what happens when John's messengers get back with the message from Jesus and they ask and what well, they get back to Jesus and they ask, they, they ask the questions or give the report. And here's what it says in, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. They say this. Jesus talked to the crowds. And then they said this to you, that there is no one greater than John who has ever lived let me say that one more time. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, of all who have ever lived, no one is greater than John the Baptist. See, here's why this is significant. When John's messengers get back to him, they give him Jesus' message and they say, um, hey, John, Jesus says, yes, he's the Messiah. He also says that you are the greatest person ever. He didn't say anything about coming for you. What this shows us and this is the part I've never noticed before. Jesus recognizes and calls John the greatest after he found out John doubted. I hope you can hear me on this point because more than anything else, this is key. You see, God doesn't abandon you because you doubt or you question. I would argue that doubt is not the enemy of faith, but doubt is the evidence of faith. Because if you're trying to have faith, it means that you're walking with God and you're moving in God's direction. Or you're trying to move in God's direction, believing in the one that you cannot see, you cannot taste, you cannot touch, but you are still trying to hold on. Jesus doesn't abandon John for his doubt. Jesus is really saying, John, I see you. I see your pain. And John's pain is not because he did something bad. But in the midst of what Jesus says, John, you were the greatest person that ever lived. John gets it. John now has context for the moment. John realizes now 
His whole life was not wasted. Now that he knows that his Redeemer lives, he can go through with suffering. Oh, see, when you know about some things, when you have context, you can then endure some things. See, if you knew that you had to dig rocks, but if you knew that the payoff was a million bucks at the end, you would dig rocks all day long, wouldn't you? Yeah, so John looks at this thing and says, now that I know that he's real, well, these sufferings, these sufferings don't seem so bad. You see, now that he knows that Emmanuel, God, is with us, with him, now he knows that Jesus is the Messiah, John's life, he realizes, is woven into the tapestry of the salvation for humankind. John sees temporary suffering, eternal gain. Because Jesus is the Messiah, the context of the jail, this moment, is placed in a completely different perspective. Oh, it's real. He's still in pain. But now John's eyes are focused on eternity and glory. In the way, in the way that we can understand the presence, the, 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 the presence of pain does not mean that God is absent. My second point. My second point is simply this. God has a purpose for your pain. Let me say it one more time. God has a purpose for your pain. Read with me, please, Isaiah chapter 43, just looking at verse, 40, verse 2 from the New Living Translation. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. And when you go through rivers of difficulty, I will, you will not drown. And when you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. John's life was spent pointing people to the Messiah and speaking truth to power, calling Pharisees out for their hypocrisy, and even calling a king who was wrong when the king and the queen knew better. John's life and pain were not waited, wasted, but they were fulfilling God's plan. And I'm glad that in many ways, I don't have to know all the things that God has for me. In fact, I prefer not to know because if I knew all of God's plan for my life, I would be picking out the parts that had hardship, pain and adversity because those are things that I would not volunteer for. I would most likely petition, God, I'm going to choose that other easy path. But I will submit to you this morning that none of us has that option. Jesus says in John 16, that in this world, you will have trouble. You're going to have trouble. Now, Jesus does say, but be of good courage, for I have overcome the world. But you see, God allows the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Christians as well as non-Christians are going to experience the bad things and some good things. You are going to have trouble. There's just something about us as Christians that we embrace God. Our suffering turns into a completely different thing. If I can just throw one more free thing out there. Some of us, we think that God is fair. Like you look and say, well, God, I've been doing all the right things. It's not fair that I don't get the rewards too. I've got some good news for you, beloved. You ready? God is not fair. You hear me? God's not fair. Because if God were fair, oh, if God were fair, then we would never know God's grace or mercy. We wouldn't, in turn, we'd receive our just reward and punishment for our disobedience and unfaithfulness. We would get justice. That's why I'm glad that God is not fair. What God is, beloved, God is just. God is looking for you. He's looking to be close to you. God is looking to do a work in your life even when things aren't going right and the rain is not the good rain falling on you. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, this is a very familiar passage for many people, but it says that God is able to work all things together for good for those who love him. You see, when we're in relationship with Jesus Christ, when we're in a relationship and we're walking by faith, our life and the moments in our life, they become transformative. Because God is at work in your joy and your pain. I got to tell you a story about my mom. Bless her heart. I, I'm hoping, I think she's probably watching this morning. So mom, um, you witness to your boy. Um, some years ago, my mother had um, or has been battling congestive heart failure for a long time. And it got to the point where she needed to have a heart valve replacement. 
And she was assigned a doctor, and I'm not going to say his name, but he's a cardiologist, a respected cardiologist in in the hometown where mom lives. And um, mom did mom did great, doing great. Some years go by, and mom develops stage four breast cancer. It's metastasized, and um, she's got to take chemotherapy. The problem with the chemotherapy is they can't just give her the garden variety drain cleaner, you know, that powerful stuff, because it would then destroy the heart valve, and then. Yeah, you get the picture. And so she needed to have a an, an EKG um, taken for over heart so they could kind of get a look at it. And so they contacted her cardiologist. And her cardiologist, they're, they're requesting that he um, evaluate this EKG they just sent. And the doctor's looking at it. And he sends a message back saying, this is not Doris King's EKG. Um, I need you to send me hers. And um, they kept saying that this is Doris King's EKG. And he says, it's not. The reason the doctor was saying that it wasn't my mother's EKG is because he didn't ex expect my mother to live very long. And that the EKG he was looking at was one of a strong heart and a healthy person. And so the doctor says, you know what? Don't worry. I'm going to come over to the hospital myself and I'll administer the EKG because I'm going to see if this is Doris King with my own eyes. And when he gets to my mother's room, he's shocked. And rather than taking immediately the EKG, he says to my mother, Mrs. King, you have always told me that your faith in God would bring your healing. And I have been a Hindu for, most, for all of my life, and I have never seen faith like yours. And I want to know more about the God who has healed you. And there in my mother's hospital room, she shares the good news of Jesus Christ with her cardiologist. And he becomes a crawler of Christ. Now, surely, surely, if mom could have known in advance time that Mrs. King, in order for someone to come to Christ, you're going to have to have a heart valve replacement and cancer. She probably would have said, um, I think not. But because she knew Jesus and allowed Jesus to work through her in whatever condition she's in, someone's name is written on the book of life. We have a member of our church. I'm not going to say her name because y'all don't know her, but, but she, she's a, a, a delightful lady. And um, she also is a cancer survivor. You would think that someone who... Who, who has been through a thing would probably want to go somewhere and just sit down. But this lady, she all by herself adds numbers to our Wednesday night Bible study, which I invite you to come to. She adds numbers to it by telling everybody about what encouragement she receives, first of all, from studying the Word of God, the comfort she receives from the friends that she has at her church, and then she even says that our pastor, he actually can teach a little bit. But this lady, all by herself, having gone through a thing, rather than saying, poor me, it feels almost like she says, why not me? Am I any better than anybody else? And so she chooses to allow God's purpose for others to come to know Christ through her suffering and even now victory. And so, beloved, I bring this message to a close. And I want to encourage you that if you are struggling with whether or not God has a hard heart, I just want you to know that the heart of God is seeking you, desires a connection and to be close with you. And that connection comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Beloved, let me just pray with you, please. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those who have heard this message today. And I would ask, Father, if there is someone who desires to know Jesus even in the midst of their suffering, I pray even now, right now, Father, that you would just break in on their lives and they would gain a sense of knowing that you see them. And I pray, oh God, that you would show them how you are working out something amazing and good even in the tough times of their lives. I pray that they would know Jesus. And so, Jesus, for those who are listening who need you, I ask that you would simply come into their hearts, wipe away their past and even the pain, and begin a new story. 
Allow them to realize that they are now a son and a daughter of God. And that today they are a new creation. Thank you for hearing this prayer. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if you prayed that prayer with me for the very first time, and you would like to know more about how you can grow in your walk with Jesus, just send me a text and just under your text message, just type text, I'm in, and send that to 708-616-1101. I'm going to respond to you personally, and I want to get you on the road to understanding how you can grow in your faith. And so this ends this series that I want to believe, but, and I'm hoping that you have found yourself in a new place of your belief and trusting in our Lord Jesus. Beloved, this has been the word of God for the people of God. God bless you. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done. Good morning. My name is Elder Vicki Bunn, and it is time for our Holy Communion. All who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that he gave his life and was sacrificed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins are welcome to partake in this Holy Communion. On the night he was betrayed, Christ met with his disciples in the upper room. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. Let us eat and partake in the bread together. Then Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them. And he said, drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it, new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us drink of the cup together. Let us pray. Jesus, you are the new covenant. You gave eternal life to us all. You are the yes to all of the promises of God when you chose to die in our place. You completely and permanently fulfilled the requirement of every covenant, which is the work that you do through your word. Lord, we thank you. We praise you for this opportunity to come together again and remember, amen. Hi United, I'm Cinnamon Poole and you're watching UCC TV. Don't forget that Election Day is officially Tuesday, November 3rd. Now is the time to plan your vote. Whether you vote early, by mail, or on Election Day, get out and vote. Let your voice be heard. Now for more news you can use.
Please join us for Bible study this Wednesday, October 14th from 6 o'clock until 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. Be sure to look for your emailed invitation and join us this Wednesday. There will be a virtual regional assembly on Saturday, October 17th from 10 o'clock a.m. until 12 noon. You must pre-register online at cciwdisciples.org to receive information on accessing the assembly. There will also be a virtual board meeting on Saturday, October 17th at 1 o'clock p.m. Please be sure to check your email for the link. Today, immediately following service at 11.45 a.m., we will have a virtual social gathering. Be sure to check your email or text messages for the link. See you all soon. Last and definitely not least, please don't forget how important it is to give. You can give through our two convenient mobile giving apps, Gift Plus or Givelify. You can give through our website at www.uccdoc.com or you can mail your offering to United Christian Church at 4351 West 180th Street, Country Club Hills, Illinois 60478. Continue to stay safe and God bless you all. This is Cinnamon Poole signing off for UCC TV. I